Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to our third in our series um, uh, for the Maryland Robotics Center. Um, once again, I want to thank Lockheed Martin for sponsoring this series. Um, today's guest is Professor Steve Collins. He is an associate professor in mechanical engineering at Stanford University, um, received his bachelor's from Cornell, then went on to do his PhD at Michigan, did a postdoc at Delft, and then spent seven years as a professor in mechanical engineering at Carnegie Mellon um, uh, prior to coming to Stanford. So I'm going to let him talk about uh, what he's the fun stuff that he's doing. Um, so welcome. Awesome. Thanks, Mary. Uh, good beer. It's great to talk this morning. Um, so I'll just dive right in. This first, my, my talk has two parts. The first, maybe third, is principled and describes the approach that we employ in the lab. And then the second two thirds is current work, a little bit more off the cuff and uh, unfinished stuff. So I'm just going to cruise through this first part. And then I'll pause and, and take your questions and discussion. And then we can sort of crawl through the ongoing current work. So the societal problem that has been my focus for the last 20 years, approximately, is that there are hundreds of millions of people who have a difficult time getting around. And that this will affect most of us at some point in our lives. So I want to design robots that you can wear on your legs that improve your mobility, especially in terms of functional outcomes like energy cost, speed, or balance, or comfort. And especially for people with disabilities, like arising from amputation, or stroke, or just the effects of aging, or uh, people that have to walk under arduous conditions, like these aid workers in Africa or soldiers. And <clears throat> when I was a, a younger researcher, I thought that because I could design clever passive dynamic walking robots and armed with a little bit of knowledge of human gait biomechanics, I'd be able to make exoskeletons that would give people superhuman performance. And I was wrong. It turns out that this problem is much harder than it seems. And um, I'm not, not wrong in the goals, but wrong in the ease of their attainment and the types of methods that would be primarily involved in getting there. And uh, just as an illustration of how challenging this is, there have been thousands of devices designed for these same purposes. And to date, still only 10 or so have demonstrated a benefit to the person using them. And I think that the main problem has been that we don't know what the device should do to help the user. People get into this field, they're mostly coming from a robotics perspective. Here we are at a robotics seminar. Um, and although we have some kinesiology here, thankfully, uh, to, to help on that side. But um, I, I think certainly I didn't appreciate just how complicated the human body is and our brain is and uh, how important individual differences are between us, such that something that helps one person can actually make things harder for another person and how much we change, especially as we're learning to use some new device. All of these features of the task um, severely limit our ability to predict a person's response to some new assistive device. And we've also been using these really slow, this slow development process based on specialized product-like prototypes. Each of them takes years to develop. They do one thing well. And when it fails, we're stuck. So that's slowed us down even more. And uh, today, I want to tell you about a, a couple of uh, ways we've been trying to get around this problem. And so, so if our predictive tools aren't working well, then maybe we need an iterative approach. We're in an evolutionary process. And if that's where we're at, then we need tools to speed and systematize our search. So we've been developing two such uh, sets of tools. The first are versatile hardware systems that we call universal device emulators that are intended to allow you to experimentally test your ideas on people more quickly. And the second are algorithms for human in loop optimization, which is intended to allow more efficient navigation of the vast set of potential designs. And this is a schematic of a typical uh, emulator system. The person wears a lightweight, oh, my, my pointer is going to work. The person wears a, a lightweight instrumented prosthesis or exoskeleton end effector that's tethered 
to powerful off-board motors and computers. And this, this means we're almost never limited by computational or actuator power as we want to try new ideas. And this allows the person to experience a wide range of different devices without the need to build new specialized hardware. Any idea you have for an assistive device can be programmed into the emulator, allowing a test of a person's response to that device in days or even minutes rather than years. And the idea here is that once we've identified effective functionalities, we can then translate those into untethered product-like devices with uh, a, a knowledge of how the person will respond to it. Another nice thing about this approach is that once you've got the off-board motors and computation solved, it's relatively easy to make new end effectors. For example, this is a prosthesis with independent control of, we call this plant reflection and inversion eversion, or if you want to say pitch and, and uh, roll. And that allows us to study new ways of improving balance for people with amputation. Uh, or this exoskeleton that acts at the hips, knees, and ankles, which we are using to learn different ways of assisting gait under a wide variety of challenging conditions, different loads, grades, and speeds. And uh, something I'm pretty excited about right now is that one of my former students has started a company to commercialize this technology, human motion technologies. And uh, they are selling these emulators to research labs. And they are now in about 12 research labs around the country and allow people who have good ideas about how you might control a device to assist a person, but maybe not the robotics background, to build one yourself to get in this game, which I'm really excited about because there's a big community studying these things, lots of creative ideas, and this tool is allowing them to uh, get in there and try things. In the long term, uh, we hope that these kinds of tools will also enable an improved prescription process in which patients can try out a device before it is prescribed and built for them. And you can quickly identify the best characteristics of that device and justify the cost of more complicated, expensive devices to insurance payers in a clinical setting. OK, so, so now, yes, yes, please. Uh, no, uh, uh, no, it's 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 not bad. So we've um, actually in our uh, some of our original work we characterized the impedance caused by the tether, and it's it's quite low. Uh, so we did some pendulum tests to see how much the damping coefficient was increased. A very small uh, effective moment, something like one newton meter about the hip total. Yeah, which which is which is small in, for these systems. Um, and we've played with a bunch of different types of tether, and, and a simple Bowden cable seems to be the best combination of low impedance and low cost. So now we have these hardware tools that allow us to test lots of ideas. Which ones should we test? We have this vast space of potential assistance strategies, and we need a way to search it efficiently. So ideally, we would like algorithms that automatically discover new generic assistance strategies, customize those to individual participants' needs, and continuously adapt to a person as they learn and grow. And one way to do that is to measure human performance while a person is interacting with a device, feed that information back to an optimizer, and, and then have that systematically vary device characteristics so as to maximize human And this might sound obvious, let me put it like that, but yet almost all design of this type of system is operated nearly entirely on the left-hand side of this diagram. Given some desired change in human performance, it's implicitly at least assumed that we have a good enough model of the system that we know what the device should do to produce that change. And my observation and argument is that we have not, we don't and that that has caused us big problems. I also want to just note that I'm, I'm not talking about tinkering here. Uh, we found that 
uh, systematic approaches and algorithmic approaches have done far better than hand tuning in these systems. And I'll provide some data for that later. And I'm not talking about optimizing some intermediate or device level parameter, like say power of the device, but optimizing the thing you really care about in the person. For example, metabolic rate, speed, indications of balance, or uh, perceived comfort. Now, <clears throat> closing this loop, of course, is also challenging. Uh, the measures that we care about are noisy. And they're time varying, especially when a person is learning to use a device. And uh, you can only get a few function evaluations before the person gets tired and you have to stop. So a lot of the algorithms that work well in simulation don't work as well in this domain. Uh, but we have made some progress. So uh, one approach that we found to be effective is this. this is, I'm going to walk you through a method for identifying the exoskeleton characteristics that minimize the metabolic energy cost of walking. And here's how it works. So you have a person uh, using an exoskeleton, and the exoskeleton behaves in some way that's defined by a control law. So you, this could be anything you like, but it's some way of mapping some parameters into the behavior of the device. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the one we've used uh, in a moment. And this control law periodically changes. And for each one, we measure the person's energy cost. We estimate their steady state metabolic rate based on a first order dynamical model and a few minutes, two minutes in this case, of transient respiratory data. Once we've evaluated a set number of control laws that form a generation, we use an evolutionary strategy to generate a new generation of control laws to evaluate. We'll go through this loop a few times. And um, in this case, we use something called Covariance Matrix Adaptation Evolutionary Strategy, CMAES. It's very popular in the graphics community. And uh, it has some properties that are attractive for this problem that I can talk about uh, if you're interested. How accurate is your metabolic? Um, I've been trying for years to get people to collect that data. And they tell me it's too hard. The victims don't like it. Huh. It's not very accurate. Uh, okay, so uh, it, so the way we collect metabolic rate is we have people wear a mask, and um, it's not too bad, but it's certainly it's expensive, and it takes on the order of minutes to get an estimate, which isn't ideal for a fielded system. So it's something in the long run we'd, we'd like to have to avoid, but for our purposes now it's tolerable. Um, the error in a, a standard metabolic rate experiment is somewhere on the order of 2 or 3%. So this is if you apply, the standard is you apply a constant activity for six minutes. You average the second three minutes of oxygen and carbon dioxide flow rate data. And then you uh, th throw that into a classical equation for energy cost. Well, I should say the accuracy, the, the consistency is somewhere around 2 or 3%. That's what the bike racers do and the uh, sure, uh, you use this, I mean, uh, use this in, in way to characterize uh, peak performance in athletes like VO2 max, yeah. like the same system. We're using it to look at sub-maximal uh, energy expenditures. Now, we are also getting additional error by using this approximation for less than six minutes. And that, domain. yes, exactly. So. But, but before we just used it, we obviously characterized the error. And it's, we get an initial about 4% uh, error from this estimate technique. Uh, a lot of that, this noise, is because of the way the uh, oxygen use or carbon dioxide production is attributed to this period of time or that period of time. And so it, it's less, the, the underlying data are less noisy than it appears here, if that makes sense, um, if that makes any sense. Uh, so it's not, it's not uncorrelated white noise. Um, the, Do they warm yeah. up before they start? We, you don't, uh, 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 well actually, we usually, yeah, so these, these periods will last about, so two minutes per control law. In a typical generation, you might see eight control laws, so 16 minutes of walking, and we usually start every uh, walking about with a couple of minutes of warm-up. Yes. 
Um, but you, you have this trade-off that you have to make a good decision about it. If you collect more data, you get more accuracy, but you get fewer evaluations before the person runs out of time. Yeah. So we picked a value of two minutes because it gives us a good trade-off between accuracy and duration. Oh, yes, yes, but still, if for any given amount of time that you have with a participant, yeah. there's going to be an optimal value here that won't correspond to six minutes, I think. But it's, a, it's an important question, and, and, and that's something we've thought a lot about. Uh, probably two minutes isn't the exact. It's rare that the, the ideal number would be an integer in minutes. So probably it's something slightly different, but that's what we've been using so far. How many breaths is it? Oh, I'm sorry to waste your time with Oh, no, no, no. It's about it, 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 the breathing rate is, yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, a few seconds per breath, usually. So you can sort of estimate from. There's also evidence here. that like 95% of real world walking bouts are less than 100 consecutive steps. So you can argue the yeah. that walking for six minutes is not terribly generalizable, even if it's steady metabolic state. Well, that's a, so that's a pushing into a different, usually that sort of pushback comes a little later in the talk. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, oh, have I, have I accidentally touched something or, oh, no. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. There we go. Uh, it's true. So most bouts of walking are short. But most of the distance that you walk in a day occurs in longer bouts, uh, lasting uh, hundreds of steps or minutes of walking. So, um, you know, we're we're still trying to solve the easiest problem here, which is how to assist steady walking at a fixed speed in a controlled environment. And until a couple of years ago, people hadn't been able to to improve performance under those conditions. So it was too ambitious to start looking at transient conditions or. Uh, but we're finally starting to get traction here, and I think the next steps are to expand the kind of behaviors that we're trying to address. Okay. Good questions. So um, in this first experiment, the way that we defined our control law was uh, we looked at providing a torque about the ankle joint, and then the way we defined it, so we have torque that's applied to the ankle joint as a function of time, and here we're uh, normalizing time to the stride period. So every time your heel hits the ground, we note that and we restart our controller, and then we estimate the stride period from as an average of uh, past stride lengths. And then we set that pattern of torque using four variables. One is the, uh, the magnitude of the peak torque and the timing at which the peak torque occurs, and then the rise time and the fall time. And there's some uh, structure to that curve that makes it smooth and nice. You can create a, a wide variety of different patterns of torque with this parameterization. We applied torque with our exoskeleton emulator to one ankle for 11 participants as they walked on a treadmill at a typical speed, 1.25 meters per second. We optimized uh, the exoskeleton for four generations, about an hour of walking for most participants. And then after we had a, uh, an estimate of the optimal parameters, we performed a separate validation study in which we compared optimized assistance parameters to walking with the exoskeleton in a zero torque mode, where it doesn't produce any, any moment about the torque. How sensitive is the performance to changes in the control? Uh, well, I think that a slide, two slides from now, let's come back to that question, because I think it's, with a little data, it's yeah. easier to answer it. So for, uh, first, I just want to talk about our, the sort of the primary outcome of the experiment, which is just energy cost. So uh, the optimized assistance pattern was able to reduce energy costs substantially for all the participants, about 14% uh, to 40% improvement, and the average is about 24%. And this might, this is probably not your field for most people in this room. So to give you some context, uh, this is four times better than the best results we'd had by hand tuning the device. And it's the largest improvement in energy economy by this measure, for any exoskeleton to date, including devices that operate at both hips, knees, and ankles. 
So the algorithmic approach here, this human in loop optimization approach made a huge difference in performance of the system. Steve. Yes. Um, so this is actually a remarkable uh, reduction in metabolic cost. And uh, you, uh, I was really surprised when I read that your paper before. Um, did you look at yeah, the metabolic cost uh, in relation to the asymmetry of uh, the gates? Uh, as in, so this was assisting one ankle, right? right. One ankle. And so, so it induces an asymmetric gait pattern, and we've. If you decrease the, the asymmetry, the metabolic rate may uh, decrease. Uh, so, uh, right, if you assist both ankles, you have uh, two benefits, potential benefits. One is that you have more assistance in some sense. And the other is that it's symmetric. And it's hard to disentangle those two things. But we have done some bilateral assistance uh, that I want to tell you about in just a minute. Yeah, yeah. And it is, it is better. Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry. To, I, I, I think it will be easier for me to explain if I tell you in a second. But I think it's a good question. Yeah. So once you've got something optimized to the user's walking pattern, yeah. do you need to continue optimizing each session? Or does one set up full flow to the next session? That is a good question, and we haven't studied it carefully enough yet. So this is uh, among the questions we're trying to address in some follow-up experiments, looking at why the approach works, and how long it takes to really converge, and how consistent those uh, parameters are. Uh, my gut check is that I think it'll be very uh, consistent for a given person day over day. Uh, over longer periods of time, months, years, or if you are detrain, then it will change. Did you also look at yeah. the metabolic uh, cost uh, during normal walking? No, so that's a, that's a good question, and and that's something I was just going to say. So the so this is the benefit of assistance over wearing the device with no torque, and the net benefit of putting on some assistive device will be that benefit of turning on plus a cost for donning it. And uh, you know we have measured the cost in this case. And so it's like 10%. So you get about a 14% improvement over normal walking. But it's not really a clean comparison because our system is tethered. Right. So, and so on, on the one hand, it's, uh, you've got the motors and control off board. So that makes it easier. On the other hand, it's way over designed for the optimized trajectories. So we don't actually know what the net benefit of a device that embeds this functionality will be until we build it and test it. And that's something we're actually in the process of doing right now. And we think that we will see a big net improvement, even after the cost of wearing that thing is included. Yeah. So you said you got a much bigger benefit compared to hand tweaking. So ultimately, did you discover something surprising about the way the system tuned it? Well, so th these are the patterns of optimized assistance. And I think there, there were two messages that we took out of from this, or, or a few. So, so one is you can see some of the parameters are really consistent. The timing of peak torque is pretty consistent. Um, so that suggests that it might, there may be a, a generic pattern of assistance that gives you a lot of the benefit of an, a customized pattern, right? It might be that we always want the peak torque to occur at a similar time, but some. Sorry, yeah. Sorry, these are different people. So each each uh, color represents a per different participant in the experiment. So this is their optimized, measured optimized pattern of torque. Hence these little weird ripples. This, you know, these are imperfections in our Bowden cables, uh, resisting dorsiflexion flexion during the onset of swing. So uh, yeah, each of this is each of these is a different person. So some people. Uh, preferred or responded better to lower torque than others. Some people responded better to later onset of torque than others. And that suggests that at least during uh, training, some customization is beneficial. I would wonder if normalizing the human development to body weight. And they are normalized to, to body Honestly. weight, yes. Yeah. Um, they're, they're, it might be that you could do even better than that. It might be that by measuring certain characteristics, height, segment lengths, uh, 
physiological, yeah, if it, like physiological cross-sectional area of the soleus muscle. So, you know, uh, there, there might be some set of measurements you can make from a person, maybe characteristics of their unassisted gait pattern that allow you to map directly to the optimized pattern of assistance if you had enough data from enough people. I think eventually we'll get there, but it will require first these devices are much more widely used, um, like tens of thousands of commercial devices out in the world, gathering data from people, and then we'll start being able to apply ML techniques. I think. Still, yeah. and a lot of the questions to me relate again to the question I asked before, which is how sensitive are the results? How sensitive is the optim optimality to the details of the curve? So it looks like even if you change the person, it doesn't matter a whole lot. But I'm sorry. How, how does that? Inf how do you infer that from the these data? Yeah. You get very similar results. Well, we had the, the change in energy cost range from 14% to 40%. I see. So big, big differences in the benefits of the device, big differences in the optimized patterns. But I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a good and correct and important question that we haven't addressed well enough yet. So the, uh, the way that you do this is you optimize for an individual person, and then you perform a sensitivity analysis which we haven't had a chance to do yet. Uh, so this is, this is published two years ago. We've completed a bunch of follow-on studies. We haven't gotten to that one yet. Um, I think it's, it's certainly the case that some parameters are more important than others, that there will be a sort of shallow bowl in, in, in some of the dimensions of this control space. Certainly, that means that as, they, as the subjects change, as time goes on, you don't get a very big degradation in performance. Absolutely, yeah. The best case is that a single generic controller gives you all the benefits. Um, now, the way I would think about this is that it should be, those dependencies should be population and task dependent. So this is data from unimpaired young people, you know, grad students, uh, walking in a on steady speed on a treadmill in a lab, and how do, let, how, do, how do you get them to let you amputate one leg, one foot? <laughs> <laughs> These are exoskeleton tests. So, uh, yeah, that experiment we can't do. This we need simulations to do that experiment. Um, but I think for more heterogene, heterogeneous populations, like people who've had a stroke, I think we expect more diversity in the optimized patterns of assistance although that remains unproven. OK, one other thing that I just want to bring your attention to when you look at these data are that uh, this pattern does not best approximate biological ankle torques. So you wouldn't come up with these patterns based on biomimicry. And this pattern does not produce the most possible positive mechanical work at the ankle joint. So you wouldn't come up with them based on simple ideas of thermodynamics. You actually need to measure performance and feed that back to discover these patterns. Yes? Uh, how many tethers do we have per ankle? How many which? How many like ropes do we have per ankle? Uh, just one rope. So it's assisting with pushing your toes down uh, only. It can't pull your toes up towards your shank. The tether is like uh, pushing it down? Uh, the tether is behind the ankle joint. So, so you've got this. This is a, a Bowden cable. It's sort of like a bicycle brake cable. And it tries to pull these two points together. So it's, pull, it's, so it's sort of um, pulling this, and that's a lever. And that tries to make the, the foot rotate this way and the shank rotate that way. Does that make sense? So there is like uh, nothing to uh, like, um, push or pull the feet up? Right. If you want to pull the toe up, which we have done in some protocols, we add a spring, a rubber band, some surgical tubing, basically, because the torques needed for dorsiflexion are a lot smaller than those for plantar flexion. So we can uh, just overcome the spring with the drive when we want to, 
and then relax the drive to get that dorsiflexion torque when we, when we want it. Does that make sense? Yeah. At the knee and hip, we use separate motors and Borden cables for each direction of torque application. And we do that so that we can uh, have good transparency when we're not applying torque. We can uh, allow the cable to go slack. And that means that if there's a little difference in the position of the exoskeleton joint versus the motor joint, it doesn't turn into a big force or torque. Does that make sense? Uh, can you like repeat? Yeah, if I, so if I throw you a rope and, I, and, I, and, we're, and I'm, I'm pulling on you with the rope and I want that force to go to zero, um, if, I'm all, if I always have, uh, n if I have no slack in the rope, then you can get a force by moving quick but, and before I can react and let rope out, right? But if I'm allowed to put a little slack in there, so now the ro rope is drooping, when you start to move, I can notice and, and respond before any tension develops. So, so if you maintain no slack, which is the case in um, like a bi-directional relocated drive, then you have very poor position disturbance uh, torque coupling. So, so it, you get a position disturbance and it develops a big undesired does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. This way, slack is our friend. These ropes, letting them go, go slack helps a lot with that problem. And that's one of the advantages over, say, like the Lopez system or some, some other um, designs that have, they've used less motors, which is nice always, but they also have much worse transparency. Okay. Great. So uh, that was good, I think. We jumped in a lot, that, and maybe we covered a lot of things, but I'll, I'll pause here. I'll just summarize and say, um, because people are complicated, we expect most of the things that we try to fail. So we want versatile hardware that allows us to fail lots of times on our way to finding something that does work. And we want to use an algorithmic approach to systematically search that space to find what works well. And uh, this is a really, uh, we're very early stage with this technology and this design approach. I'm not uh, an algorithm developer, and I think that there are good opportunities here for coming up with new ways of optimizing these systems, and I'd invite you to try your hand at it, or maybe just apply it to new problems. So I'm going to pause there and, and see if there are more questions about just the basic approach and philosophy. Okay, good. We've got a, what, a very engaged audience. I like this. This is great. You've been doing a good job with them. All right. So now I want to move on to um, current work. And this is all unpublished and ongoing. And some of the sample sizes are small. but. It's exciting, and I want to talk about it with you. And please feel free to continue to jump in with any questions you might have. So the first thing that we're thinking about is, how does optimization interact with motor learning of these tasks? We're also applying the technique to new devices and activities and objectives. And that includes uh, people with disabilities. And then we're trying to translate effective approaches outside the lab. So when we, one of the observations we had in our that first study I, I talked to you about was that <clears throat> people took a long time to learn how to use the exoskeleton. And you can start to see this just by watching the person use the device. So here we have a participant walking in normal street shoes. And then they are uh, going to wear the device in zero torque mode. And now we'll have a pretty good pattern of assistance early in the optimization process. You can see there's a lot of upper extremity involvement. They look really uncomfortable. Here's a, almost the same pattern of assistance after optimization during validation. So um, one of the assumptions that we had made is that the person would be able to quickly adapt to take advantage of the exoskeleton, whatever kinds of exoskeleton uh, features we threw at them. And then we would mostly optimize exoskeleton characteristics to meet the person's needs. And it turns out that at least equally important is helping the person learn how to use the exoskeleton. So the 
person needs time to adapt, and maybe they need some training to adapt. Yes? Yes. The walking speed is the same in each condition. That's correct. The, the, the subject can decide the walking speed, or? No. The, in this experiment, we have a fixed treadmill speed, and the, walk, the person has the task of staying on the treadmill. So they have a, an, an implicit position control task they have to perform. And they're constrained. They can change their speed a little bit for a little bit of time, but not for too long. Isn't that a two-part optimization? The victim is trying to... You keep saying victim. <laughs> We're making it easier. They're, uh... I use that all the time, even for the surgical robot. <laughs> uh, but um, so he's trying to optimize his performance given the machine. Yes. And you're trying to optimize the machine given his performance. Yes. So yes, exactly right. So, so there's a it's a co optimization process. Yes. So you what he co adaptation. You change, he gets to adapt, you change again, he gets to adapt. That's the Exactly so. And and this is as I mentioned, this is one of the features of the problem that makes the optimization difficult. And um, one of the things that it seems helps about the CMA algorithm I described is that it's quite forgetful about old data. So each generation is evaluated independently. Mm -hmm. And then the way you come up with your estimate of the optimal parameters, you update your estimate of the optimal parameters, it's just a weighted average of the best performing parameter sets from this last generation. That puts memory back in. Uh, Yes. Yeah, so, so, I mean, the parameters that you search, the space you search depends on your history. Okay. But um, your new estimate of the optimum, is, it, it depends on the recent history, but not prior to this generation, if that makes sense. So, so yeah. So, you, I mean, you need, you need to have some information about the past. We, we can't look in the future. The present doesn't give us very much in this. This incident time doesn't give us very much. So we have to look at some finite uh, horizon into the past, right? It's just that it's, uh, if you compare it to, say, uh, an approach in which you're yeah, yeah, it, it, mapping it, it, the space. The it makes it work better. That, I, okay, I get it. Sure. But like um, a, a really sample efficient optimization approach is a, a Bayesian optimization, where uh, you are explicitly trying to determine the landscape. Uh, that between the parameters and the cost. Uh, but having inaccurate data in that approximation screws things up. So, um, you know, we, we, we came to this approach after trying many other uh, theoretically better optimization algorithms. So, um, because of these learning dynamics, one of my PhD students, Katie Pogansy, has been performing a follow-up experiment in which we uh, have been looking at both uh, a, st a generic pattern of assistance, that's this blue line, and an optimized pattern of assistance, that's this red line, over multiple days of optimization and training. And uh, what we see is that, indeed, it can take several days for some participants. Some participants adapt uh, relatively quickly. Sometimes the adaptation dynamics are kind of nonlinear, and sometimes it takes several days to become an expert user of the device. And it can take several days of optimization for the algorithm to converge on optimal parameters. So one thing that we can say for sure about our first experiment is that we didn't give participants enough time to become expert. By the way, these are all naive users of exoskeletons. And we didn't give the algorithm enough time to converge. And when we do that, uh, we can start to make a few uh, stronger claims. So one thing is that if you just put the device on the person's leg with these are th this blue bar, again, is the generic parameters. These are pretty good parameters. The response of the person isn't great. Very small change in energy cost. So this has been an experimental paradigm that has been used in many evaluations of assistive devices. Just bring the person on, give them a brief familiarization, then measure their response. And it may be that 
a lot of the failures we've seen of those devices have not actually been failures of the device, but failures in training the user. Does it ever go positive? I mean, above? Yes. I, and yeah, so, some participants have an increase in energy cost with that generic pattern when they first put it on. It's, you know, the, the error bars are. I mean, does it get yeah. worse? I guess is really the question. Yes. Like you put it on. Your energy cost goes higher sometimes. Yes, absolutely. And also, I mean, within, these are data from six-minute trials. Within the six minutes, there's substantial uh, change in energy cost. In the first couple minutes, it's elevated compared to the last couple minutes, usually. So there's some adaptation that's happening quickly there. Um, we also see, so there are three different groups in this experiment. I'll just focus for now on this continued optimization group. So these folks, we just started the optimization on day one and we kept going, we, we paused and then picked it up where we left off and day two and paused and picked up where we left off and so on. And what we see is um, when they're well trained, now instead of a four or five percent improvement in energy cost, they get about a 30 percent improvement in energy cost with a generic controller. And then with the optimized controller, they get about a 40 percent improvement in energy cost. So this answers a few of the questions we've had a little more Clearly, one is, do you need to customize? Well, you get about three quarters of the benefit for this population and task and device with a generic uh, assistance pattern, which is good if you, because you could make that more cheaply into a product and you wouldn't have to go through this exhaustive um, process of customization. But if you really want to maximize performance, there, that is a meaningful improvement to customize to an individual person. Another question. Uh, Oh, God. oh, bilateral versus unilateral. And so here we're seeing about a 40% improvement. In the other experiment, we had about 24% improvement. So uh, perhaps some of the difference is due to the increased training period, but it seems like you can get more of a benefit from bilateral assistance. Do you, do, do you also plan to bring them back after like a week, a month, and to see if uh, there's retention? Behavior, That's a good idea. So if I suggest that to Katie, I think she will, she will kill me on the spot. Uh, she's in her fifth year as a PhD student. And this is, this is just these protocols are, I mean, you're looking at uh, 15 participants, six days each. They're in the lab for four hours. You know, she's in the lab for six hours, right? It's, like, it's a really exhausting protocol. So I think a adding conditions at this point, you can why don't, I'll give you her email address. You can suggest. <laughs> Uh, but it's a really good question. The retention, I, I'm not sure. It's, it's clear that the training is important. I'm not sure how much it's retained or what those dynamics are like. Well, and I wonder if, uh, if you compare yeah. the, the first day and uh, uh, the day uh, uh, you bring the subjects after a long period of time, if the, the metabolic cost will actually increase as compared to the first day, then it means that they actually change their behavior. That will, that will actually be less beneficial for if you use the, the, uh, the algorithm that you originally used. That's an interesting idea, yeah. Are there any motion patterns that you can associate to in optimal? Or in other words, obviously getting a VO2 mask for everybody and having them wear that when they optimize this as a product would be kind of cumbersome. But are there specific patterns of, say, their gait goes to this relative length or they the force distribution on their foot changes relative to the normal stride? It's a really good question, and it's something we're interested in. That we're, so we're now, these data are unpublished and hot off the presses, and we're starting to try to look for those kinds of associations. Uh, some, a couple of the really simplistic things that we've considered so far haven't correlated very well, but it seems like there should be some patterns in there, and then we could use that um, so you mentioned to try to estimate energy consumption. I'm a little less sure about that, I, but, but I, I think it'd be interesting to maybe use them as a target to enhance training using biofeedback. If we know how you should adapt your kinematics or muscle activity, then we can show you your kinematics or muscle activity and ask you to try these targets. In terms of trying to estimate metabolic rate in, in a fielded condition, um, this is a hard problem. We're also, I have a, a collaboration with a couple of other faculty at Stanford. We're working on this. But um, in order to get an estimate, 
that captures what you care about, you really need not just, um, and it's, not, it's not the same as the estimate that would satisfy you for your smartwatch or whatever where there's a set of stereotypical behaviors and then you really you're classifying is the person walking and at what speed and then you look up what the energy consumption probably is given their body weight and, and height and stuff like that. In this case, we're seeing these really complicated changes in coordination pattern within the muscles that have big effects on energy consumption. So they're, in, in this case, you know, they're walking at the same speed. So it's walking at the same speed. The kinematics are really similar, and yet there's a 40% change in metabolic rate. And so our uh, estimator of energy cost would have to be trained on a, quite a rich set of data to be useful in that context. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, sorry, yeah. I think he had his hand up first. Yeah. Uh, so, like, why did the customized assistance uh, lead to an increase? Oh, okay, yeah. So these are two different groups. So um, each, each group is five participants, <coughs> naive, before the experiment, never having used an exoskeleton. This group um, experienced simply the generic pattern over and over again. So we, we, everything was the same about the experiment. Uh, so, so like the, the experience of being in these two experiments was exactly the same, except that when we change the control law, we always change it to the generic control law. And we find is that we thought maybe the optimization process itself could help train the person because it gives them variation. And variation training is known to be beneficial in some motor learning contexts. It looks like it didn't, it's not important in this problem, and these folks trained just as well with the generic controller as people that experience optimization. This group, we reset optimization every day. So every time they came in, we started from a, uh, the same seed, and the variance in the control laws they experienced increased, so it went, you know. So they never uh, end up spending a lot of, they don't end up spending a lot of time really close to their optimal control law. And we see that we can screw up training Right, with too much variation. So that's what we take away from that group. So, so the torque pattern is, is open loop in a sense, in, a sen in the short term, right? Yes, so it just on a step-by-step -step basis, well, open so loop in time. They suddenly stopped the drive. Yes, or correct. Or you tell somebody shuts it down or you ramp it down. Or that's exactly right. Okay. So uh, to make these things practical, we'll need to uh, either have control architectures that are more responsive to quick changes, like phase-based instead of time-based control, which I think you could easily map this to a phase-based controller. And, or, I don't know if you even need EMG, uh, well, oh, EMG-based control. Yeah, we've tried this also, but the EMG-based control is trickier. Control, but, uh, control in the big sense, right? In terms of turning it on and off. Oh, sure, so classifying their behavior based on Muscle activity is one possibility. So, but and 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 sometimes it, there's been a great deal of work on classifying behavior based on kinematics and muscle activity, and it has reasonable accuracy. Levi Hargrove's group has 101 papers on this topic, and EMG helps. Why not, um, why not use an IMU? They're dirt cheap, and they would detect exactly what's going on. That's also a good approach. Uh, but so this is not the problem that we're trying to solve right now. Yeah. Uh, we we've just been trying to figure out. For a given behavior, how do you fix it? But I think it's a, it's, it's a really important question um, to, before you get to practical devices. Um, we have until 3 o'clock, is that right? OK. So you have 10 minutes remaining. I have like 37 more slides. <laughs> so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to cruise very quickly so you get all the fun stuff. And then maybe uh, I don't have anything, any meetings after this. So if you have burning questions. I, I pledge to stay here and talk with you as long as you want. OK. So another direction we're going is trying to optimize higher dimensional spaces. So we have our hip, knee, ankle, exoskeleton. And obviously, you need more parameters to define its control. In this case, we used a nine-parameter uh, controller. And here we're you know, looking at different patterns, weighted, uphill, walking, stuff like that. And in our first tests, we see we can get about 30% improvement in energy economy. We know this is not very good because we can get 40% just assisting the ankles. So we think that probably the parameterization itself wasn't very good. And this is, this is where intuition and biomechanics 
comes in because this tells us how to set up the optimization problem. What knobs do we need to be able to turn to get to the best performance? Uh, we're also working on running. And if we apply exactly the same optimization approach with the ankles, same parameterization and everything, uh, we did this with 10 participants. We see we can get also about a 25% improvement over uh, zero torque here with bilateral ankles. This is also uh, illustrates something cool about the approach, which is you can compare the best version of one device to the best version of another class of devices. So here, this is the this power device I described earlier. This here we uh, the parameterization encodes a passive device where you have a clutched spring, and the parameters are the angle at which the clutch engages, the stiffness of the spring, and some nonlinear properties of the spring. And here we see that the best Clutch spring only gives you about a 2% improvement in energy economy. It's statistically significant, but not meaningful for the runner. So moving forward, as we look towards making untethered versions, we're focusing on powered ankles. What's that running shoes kind of shape? Oh, this? That's normal shoes, street shoes. Um, uh, we're also looking at different outcomes. So I started with energy cost because it's one number we wanted to go down. It's been very hard to improve in the past. We're also looking at increasing self-selected walking speed. So in this case, first we had to develop a way to self-pace the Burtek treadmill. We did that based only on the forces that the treadmill measures. And then we validated that self-selected walking speed on the treadmill uh, matched well self-selected walking speed over ground in a, actually five different conditions uh, in a N equals 10 experiment. And that's on its way to publication. And then we ran the same human loop optimization algorithm, same exoskeleton parameterization, but now instead of trying to minimize energy costs, we try to maximize self-selected walking speed. And we've done this with 10 participants now, and we get about a 40% increase in self-selected walking speed, which is also <coughs> big and exciting. And we see that uh, cost of transport simultaneously goes down a little bit. That's the energy you use per unit distance traveled. And we've, uh, I, didn't, I didn't display it here, but we threw in a few other uh, conditions to make sure that we're getting uh, good data. And with uh, hand-picked controller, self-selected walking speed decreases. With the generic from the other experiment, self-selected walking speed does not increase as nearly as much. So those are some of the exciting results we have recently with applying this approach to unimpaired people. Now, I, of course, we got into this because we wanted to help people with disabilities. So an obvious first thing to try is exactly the same controller and put the exoskeleton on product limb of an individual with chronic stroke. And what we have found is that we don't see the same level of improvement in energy economy. And we think, uh, just anecdotally watching people use the device, that it has to do with the person's ability to adapt to it. So we've been trying a few different things. I don't have any results yet, but uh, giving people biofeedback to try to help them to target different changes uh, in response to device assistance. And one of the joints where we noticed people had a difficult time adapting was at the knee. So you get a lot of hyperextension of the knee when the ankle plantar flexion turns on just due to dynamic coupling. And so we're trying to assist the knee joint as well. We hope that that will uh, lead to improved so he's effects. Suggests another issue, which is that for straight stroke victims, you have to worry about stability. Balance, absolutely, yes. That's, that's true. So during this training period, we uh, allow the participant to hold on, yeah. Uh, and stability is something we're also quite interested in. Um, <clears throat> and I'll talk to you about, uh, let me come to that in a, se in a second. Sorry, yeah, I know. You guys have, you're, you're ahead of the game. You know all my slide, my whole slide deck before I get to it. Um, so we, we've also been interested in trying to help people with amputation. Nothing has worked. We've tried literally 14 different versions of the human loop optimization, different architectures, different protocols. Nothing has improved energy cost using these sort of propulsive uh, methods. And this is consistent with experiments we've done where we simply systematically vary the amount of push-off work and measure energy cost, that where we've seen no change in energy cost, regardless of what the device does. So, uh, I worry that there may be something more fundamental here about how people can coordinate their movements with the prosthesis following amputation. Um, so to try to, like the, the best way to try to restore those 
sensory pathways and control pathways is osseointegration with the direct neural interface. But that, te that technology is still um, developing. And uh, this, so we wanted to just test some ideas quickly. So we made this um, wrist exoskeleton that teleoperates the ankle prosthesis. So the ankle prosthesis follows the angle of the wrist exoskeleton and you are, it haptically renders the ankle torque on the wrist. And we're just starting to see if this will help people to better control the uh, device. Uh, another thing we're trying is just taking that ankle exoskeleton and put it on the sound limb of somebody with amputation. And here we've tested three participants are through the protocol. We have another two started. And it doesn't look good. The improvement in energy economy is only about 5% on average compared to that 25% we're seeing with less training in unimpaired individuals. Yeah. So baseline metabolic uh, cost? And when I say 5%, I'm saying I'm talking about compared to zero torque. So this is their, their experienced change in energy cost with assistance on the device. Yeah, but I'm asking. Uh, are they starting from a totally different baseline? Well, people with amputation uh, often have a higher energy cost sure. of walking, uh, depending on the group, maybe 20% for somebody with unilateral transtibular amputation like this. Um, although that isn't always the case. Very fit individuals, uh, Elizabeth Russell Esposito has shown uh, with some soldiers who have amputation that you don't always experience an increase in energy cost following amputation. Nevertheless, we'd, we'd like for the device to make walking as easy as possible, even if you don't start it with a deficit. How much, what kind of right of amputees have you had? Since obviously there's a difference between a tran, you know, cutting off right across the thigh. Right? Whole, the whole gambit. So, uh, you know, a 20 year old um, with uh, amputation her entire life, actually, a couple of people that fit this category, uh, people in, in their you know, 30s to 50s who have amputation because of trauma, car accident, motorcycle accident, people in their uh, 50s or 60s with amputation due to dysvascular disease, diabetes. So we've tested a wide range of etiologies. Patients, I don't think that explains it. Um, and this, I would say this is, to me, fairly convincing evidence that there's something else going on. Because uh, you know the person has all the same musculature, and they have the ability, same ability to sense and control what's happening at that joint that we're assisting. And uh, it's hard to come up with a mechanics-based or first principles-based argument as to why they shouldn't receive a large benefit from this device or similar benefit as people without amputation. The only thing that I can come up with is that um, it relates to how people learn how to use these devices and that there are maybe intrinsic learning systems that are disrupted by the amputation. Uh, so, because usually in a, a gait task, you have both legs working together in some way. And so there's, it could be that we've evolved to uh, require some input from both legs to, to, in order to adapt well to these things. It could be, I, I, I don't know, yeah. But it's, it's pretty hard to explain. As a roboticist, you'd say, that's ridiculous. Who would ever design a system like that? But we evolved over a long period of time. It could be that things like this How many exist. I don't know. Because it could be there's a lot of learned motion patterns based on the fact that a prosthetic is much different from an actual. Oh, sure. Well, that was our, one of our first thoughts, is that it just takes them longer. And so one of the first things we did in our experiments was to give them 10 times as long to adapt to each control. So we, we've given people a long time to adapt. We've done, we're not scared of long, hard experiments. It does not seem to be what's at play. What a lot of their students are. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Could you measure what they're doing? Yeah, now we were, I was going to fly through slides, and then and you guys keep jumping in. Um, I'm just going to be very quick here, because I know we're out of time. But I will talk, I will answer any question that you have afterwards. So another thing we're interested in is balance. And this is a common complaint among people with amputation. So we developed this prosthesis that can control these three different contact points. So you can control the center pressure. And you can use that for balance or for other fun things. And we're using it to 
for example, to cancel out irregular terrain to make, try to make it easier to walk on uneven surfaces, common complaint. And this is still at the early stages, and we're seeing some, some exciting results. Um, we're also interested in recovery from big disturbances. So we built this system that my, my students call Bumpum. Uh, this is Rong and, and Michael. And this is open source, $1,500 all 3D printed or catalog parts, and we're publishing the design so you can have one too, just like our uh, self-pacing algorithms for the Burtec. And it results in very good force tracking characteristics for, for the cable. So we can start to apply big disturbances and then train exoskeletons using these human in loop optimization approaches, how to uh, help people to recover from those big disturbances. Yeah, no problem. No problem at all. <laughs> Although I, I, I am a little, um, I, uh, my student and I have to talk about the fact that he's not wearing a harness in this video. Um, anyways, so that's all cool stuff, and I am going to just stop there because I know we're out of time. Thank you very much for your attention. And like I said, I will stay here. Please. Uh, Feel free to, to jet. I know it's after 3 o'clock. And anybody who wants to hang out, I will answer all questions. Yeah, so Ross. On the, um, I'll call it the torque optimization of the, the yeah. um, exoskeleton. Is it, can you constrain it so that it has to be a, a passive device you could hypothetically build, like make it so that the average power is zero or something like that? Yes. Yes, uh, you can. And we have done in our running protocol. So. That's what it sounded like. I wasn't sure. Right. So, so in this case, the spring-like controller, uh, the way we constrained it to be uh, passive is that we, the parameters we adjusted were these design parameters for a passive device, the spring stiffness, the angle at which the spring is engaged, and this nonlinear curving, whether it's softening or stiffening spring. Um, so we, and there are other ways to, to constrain yourself to energetically passive outcomes. Uh, but this is a pretty straightforward literal one, and, and it, it works. Uh, well, you know, we, improvement in energy economy wasn't as good as we wanted, but, yeah. yeah. Are you measuring the torque that they're producing on the device? Well, we can infer it from inverse dynamics. So um, in, not in all of our protocols, but in some of our protocols, we have motion capture markers, and then they run on instrumented treadmill, and then we can estimate what was the total joint torque, and then we know from measuring what the exoskeleton contribution was. Yes? I mean, so in terms of adaptation, can you tell that they're just doing something out of phase or something strange about it? Like, kind of gauge the level of adaptation? Well, I, so I, I think what you need to know is what does good behavior from the person look like before you can talk about whether their behavior is getting better. So uh, we, we have some very crude observations like the total ankle torque does increase um, compared to normal torques. So uh, you see like more total ankle power than you see unassisted. And the biological contribution drops a little bit, but not so much that it uh, compensates entirely for the exoskeleton. But it's, I, I think it's still too early. We have, we ha we have, there's some data we haven't processed, and there's, it's also like a small sample size. Uh, so, so really, I, I, uh, right now, we're most confident about the process by which you identify good characteristics of a device. We're confident about some of the characteristics of a good generic device. But I think it's too early to say what is a good adaptation by the person. And I would also say that, yeah. Yeah, but your good adaptation, adaptation may look different from my good adaptation because of individual differences. So um, I think something, something, that, uh, something provocative I just want to say to the biomechanics people in the room is that, uh, you know, in a lot of these basic scientific experiments, we change something, we measure the person's kinematics and kinetics, and then we say, oh, well, this changed because blah, 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 blah. And I think, really, in the biomechanics community, you give me any set of squiggles, I can tell you a story that explains those squiggles. And I don't know how <clears throat> much that has to do with anything like fundamental to what's happening 
uh, in many cases. You know what I mean? So, right, trajectories, especially. Yeah. So, um, so I think I, I have a great deal of humility when it comes to saying why it works. See you, Tim. Thank you. So, okay. I think you're underestimating how different old people are from young people. <laughs> That, that, that's entirely possible also. So uh, one of our next steps is also to apply these techniques to older people that don't have a, a major impairment, like, like arising from stroke. So well, but their reflexes are slower. Yep. Their vision is worse. Yes. Um, their sensors are not as accurate. Absolutely true. The muscle is weaker per unit volume, etc. No, uh, these are all... It's hell to be old. Sorry to hear that, but I'm also, I, uh, I also respect that you made it. You know, good work. It's, uh, it's an accomplishment. Um, <laughs> but, but I, I so, see you later. Yep. So, but my untested intuition is that these techniques are going to work quite well for unimpaired older individuals. That's my untested assertion. I think that the the big the big limitation is if you have um, a serious change to the nervous system that affects your ability to adapt to new things. Rather than um, some, like, a distributed degradation all the way across in terms of precision of motor control, say. I, I don't think the precision of motor control is the key. That's, but, just, but uh, again, untested assertion, just my, my guess. <laughs> uh, this is a good point. Yes. I'm almost embarrassed to ask an engineering question. No, please, <laughs> please. Um, are, is that actuator system with the cables actually able to produce enough torque and give you sort of the bandwidth you need to simulate like variety of systems? Like, it seems like I, from what I remember, we were looking at those cables. For, the yeah, exoskeleton, they're very flexible. Mm -hmm. So if you were trying to do something else, is that really going to be? Oh, no. So it's a good. It's a, this is a good question. So uh, they're good enough for us. I don't know if it's good enough for all applications. It depends. So, um, in in what we found is that what we want to control is the torque of the device. We don't want to control the position of the device. If we wanted to control the position of the device, this would be not a good approach, right? Um, we want to control torque. And so we really want compliance in series between our motor and the human. And that can be achieved in several ways. In our system, it's achieved in part at this interface because of the person's squishiness in their body and the strapping. And it's partly achieved in this tether and we've previously actually placed intentional springs in series. And actually, we can get slightly better torque tracking with well-selected spring stiffness. But it adds complexity. And so it doesn't end up being worth it. So uh, I think that the architecture you choose depends on your goals. If you want torque control and you're interacting with some unpredictable system like a person that has pretty fast movements, then you need serious compliance. And you can't uh, do it all. It, OK, if you need high torques, and torque control, then you need that. If you're doing a haptic device, then you could have, say, a non-gear reduced motor, you know, voice coil actuator, and then you can have uh, pretty good transparency and, and so on. Uh, does, that all, does that all make sense? Yeah, mostly, I, I yeah. know like, we had a project uh, like, like John was doing where he, he was actuating a knee mm -hmm. using a PAM, and that required pretty substantial uh, force. Yes. But that, yeah. Or need, because you have a very small uh, moment arm. Yes. So the, so, uh, well, let me just give you the numbers. So the, the peak torque we can produce with this exoskeleton is about 120 Newton meters. Uh, the peak power we can achieve, it, it's, really, it's really velocity driven, and it's in the kilowatt range, mechanical. And the, the thing we really care about to talk about the dynamic range is the closed loop torque control bandwidth. And the way we test this is we lock out the joint and then try to you know, follow sinusoids of different frequencies. And it's somewhere in the 15 to 25 hertz range for this. So it's pretty good um, for 
a, a serious elastic situ system. For our prosthesis, we get more in the 25 to 35 hertz range just because of the stiffness of the, the interfacing elements. Um, and, and the 15 to 25, that's when we put the device on a person, then we lock out their joint using straps. And there's some fun video that I don't have in the slide deck, but you, know, you see the person's leg going. <laughs> um, so the advantage over uh, pneumatic actuation approach is that, one, the only uh, non-relocated drive bit is this little string. So it all, it's almost massless. Another is that um, in the pneumatic systems you have, you have to push a lot of air into that cylinder or uh, uh, balloon until before you get your force. So that tends to result in a lower bandwidth, at, at least in my academic calculations and looking at some of the previous devices out there. Um, hydraulics, you can get you know, better bandwidth, but you, have a, you tend to have a heavier cylinder on the leg. So for these kinds of systems, we, we, we've been sticking with, band, uh, with bone cables. But you have, you have a, a lot of loss in the cable. So um, there, you know, this is a very complicated uh, system. It has stiction. And we lose maybe 50% of our power on route between the motor and the joint. But for our purposes, we don't care because we just have a 480-volt uh, three-phase in the wall. And then we measure torque directly at the joint. And as long as you're measuring the force at the joint, it, you can compensate for all of those messy dynamics of the Bowden cable. In our case, we often use a, an iteratively learned feedforward compensation component, if that makes sense. Yep. OK, cool. Uh, yeah, please. Do you mind giving us to the last topic? Oh, you want to know about the last, the, the untethered stuff? Yeah, sure. Well, I can, but um, does, who wants to see the untethered stuff? OK, I, I think it's bare, a bare majority, so sorry. Uh, to those who don't. So, um, OK, what, what we want to do is get to untethered devices that aren't bulky and energy hungry. One way to do that is to try to be unpowered. And there now are a few devices that show improvements in energy economy using unpowered devices. This is one that we developed a few years ago. It's an exoskeleton. It has a little clutch and a spring and engages the spring when your foot's on the ground. And that offset, it uh, offloads some of the uh, torque production from the calf muscles and Achilles tendon to the device. It uses no energy itself, but it reduces energy cost of walking with the right spring by a few percent. But it's not very controllable, so we've been working on these electroadhesive clutches so we can use computer control to decide when you get an engagement. So the clutches themselves are these little flexible sheets of aluminum sputtered mylar. And when you uh, put them on top of each other and, and apply no voltage, then they slide freely past one another. And then if you apply the low, low voltage of about 300 volts, they adhere through electrostatics and then withstand large shear forces. And uh, you can use that for a variety of interesting things, like engaging a different number of springs so you can stiff this selection and that sort of thing. And uh, the the here's the more detail on the characteristics. So one can hold about 200 newtons, weighs less than 2 grams, uses less than a milliwatt of power to cycle at 1 hertz. At 300 volts is low enough you can do standard electronics. They engage and disengage in 20 milliseconds, which is very fast uh, for these kinds of systems. You know, that you know, corresponds to that 20 to 50 hertz bandwidth that we are talking about earlier. The mass of the whole thing you see there is about 26 grams. It has very high efficiency of energy capture and return in, in the rubber springs we use, actually not pictured here in the previous one. And we've put them through millions of cycles of operation without fatiguing them out. So uh, my former student, Stuart Diller, started a company called Estat Actuation. And the cool thing is you can buy some now. So, you, so for like 100 bucks or something, you can get a little electrical control unit and clutch. So it's a, like a development kit, and that's awesome. I'm really excited about that. This is a recent development in the last month. So you should totally, if you're interested in this stuff, email them and try to get some stuff. Now, the, the, what I really want to use this for is 
high bandwidth, discretely variable force control for energy recycling. And the, the basic idea is this. You, what you want is you have an output that interacts with the spring through a CBT. So you can capture energy from the system and then return energy to the system at high efficiency. You're not using a generator and a battery and all this stuff. You, you, you lose a lot of energy when you go through that loop. Um, but mechanical springs, you can get very high energy return. The problem is in robotics, we don't have a good CBT for this. CBTs, they usually uh, can't shift except at higher speeds, and they tend to be big and heavy and, and so on. They, they're not so bad for car engines, really bad for my purposes here. So instead, what if you have a pair of clutches on your spring? So if you engage this clutch, now the spring is connected to the output, and you feel the force of the spring. If you disengage this clutch and engage this one, the energy is stored in the spring, so you haven't lost it, but the output moves freely. So that's a discrete variation in force, but you only have two, two levels of force to pick from. What if you have lots of these springs and clutches in parallel? And now, since we have such small and low power clutches and low mass clutches, this starts to become feasible. We can have systems with tens or hundreds of independently controlled clutches and do things like this. Now, there are some problems. The control problem turns out to be really hard. And I'm not going to go into all of it, but it, we formulated it as a mixed integer quadratic program and solve for optimal control. And if you do that and you compare our energy recycling actuator to just an electric motor with an optimized control pattern and uh, an optimized parallel spring, you can see, so this, this blue, these blue dots are the energy um, consumed by the motor with optimized parallel elasticity, and these red circles are the corresponding energy consumption by our energy recycling actuator for a bunch of different patterns of joint movement and torque, and we get an average savings like 50%, and the best savings of you know 80% or something like that. So we think that these could allow us to have much more efficient actuation in some mobile robotics systems. So that is the, those are the last slides. And also, my students are awesome. Thank you so much. This is all their work. And thanks to our sponsors, uh, especially NSF. And you guys should submit to Science Robotics. It's great. You'll get a fair shake. Okay. Yes. So in the amputee city, um, did you ever ask the subjects to look at their feet while walking? I'm asking this because the proprioception in that area is gone for significant health. And uh, we know from some cases like Ian Waterman, the man who lost his body, couldn't feel his body. Yes. And he had to learn walking by just looking at his feet. And if the lights were off, he couldn't walk. Yes. So, um, we don't ask them to look at their feet, but they often do look at their feet. Um, and I, I think you're right that the change in perception has an important effect on a person's ability to control what's happening with that device. And I don't have a good solution other than we need to, something that's worth trying is, is trying to, as best as possible, restore the circuitry, the neural circuitry that is lost during amputation. So restore the, the control and uh, sensing pathways. Maybe yeah, may, maybe the haptic device, but you know, you don't want to walk around doing this all the time, right? So, like as a as a functional, right, right. So I I think you know it's a dec it's a multi decade problem I think, uh, and it you know there's the neural interfaces that just have to get better, and then our we have to be much more sophisticated than we are now in inter interfacing with the nervous system. I, I, this one man's opinion. Yeah. So, uh, just a quick question regarding the human in loop test which you've done for the prosthetic people. I mean, uh, so, have you taken into consideration the lateral talk uh, which the person might uh, have to encounter? Because the way we shift the force, for, the uh, body weight will be different. Uh, for a prosthetic person, because he he may not have that kind of actuation at uh, the inactive leg. So, uh, do you think that would that has to do some 
uh, something to do with reduced efficiency with the it, it, may, it may. So so the one thing that we've done with prosthetic devices that has shown an improvement is to target balance. So um, in, in this case, what we did is we used the device to apply an eversion torque in proportion to the deviation in the person's center mass acceleration from the normal pattern. So they, you know, they're walking, and we take an average of their uh, our, our estimate of the center of mass movement on a typical stride over many strides. And then on this stride, we say, what's the deviation? And we just put that through a gain and, and add in a nominal torque and then apply that at the prosthesis. And we see that if you, ha if you use uh, a, if you set the gain to zero and then you set a desirable positive gain, you see a reduction in energy cost for the person. And that like five to ten modest improvement, five or ten percent improvement in energy cost. And if you, and I'm not showing this for simplicity, but if you apply a negative gain, then energy cost goes up. It is, that's not fun. Um, also, do you think the direction in which uh, the torque is being applied on the leg matters? Because if you provide the torque in the lateral direction, it would uh, it would help uh, have an efficient uh, energy consumption. Sorry, I don't understand what you mean. Uh, so you're, you're just providing the, the torque, torque in a lateral direction. In the lateral so in this in this case, um, so when you I, I I have a hard time processing the lateral. So lateral is like this, right. and so torque in the lateral direction is like would be like this or this. so you mean flexion extension torque, or do do you mean like uh, uh, I don't mean why not provide actuation in this direction have a a theater in this direction as well. A which? In the direction, in this a, direction. A which in that direction? Uh, a a theater, uh, an actuator in this direction which would help the body shift its balance. Uh, so you're saying you want me to slide the foot sideways under the person's leg? Right. So ah, okay. Well, that's, you know, you know, we haven't tried that and that's interesting and that would require kind of a different architecture to what we've got and it'd be more of a position control, control device and probably less subjective torque control and more of like a position control thing. And it's worth, it's interesting and worth trying. Now this device can shift the center pressure side to side okay. in a similar way that, the, that a person can. So after your foot goes on the ground, you can still change your effective ground contact point by using these inversion eversion moments, right? And this can do the same thing. Um, but you know the range, you could get a much bigger range if you had like a linear slide that could go back and forth. That, that, that's a cool idea. And it could work, I don't know. Um, one, one thing to keep in mind though is that the moment on the socket that people tolerate is limited. If you produce a big moment on the socket, people don't like it. So actually, this device already can produce more inversion inversion torque and people will tolerate. Good seeing you, Ross. Yeah, take care. That, that brings me to something that I had been wondering about. Yeah. Is there any questionnaire kind of thing? I mean, obviously it's more qualitative than quantitative of comfort levels for the people using prosthetic legs? Because I'm sure at some point the actual yeah. force as they're moving faster or harder might become in and of itself. Ultimate. So uh, one thing that we've done is to try to optimize the person's um, self-reported comfort or uh, preference, happiness with the device, overall happiness with the device. And uh, that gets to be, so the tricky part there is that people are really bad at giving you an absolute value. So if you, a, if you ask, you know, if we ask people to score each thing the way that, in, with the same kind of algorithm we use for energy cost, it, they're really inconsistent and we can't optimize the same way. But the solution is side-by-side -side preference, like just relative preference. It, just like when you go to the optometrist, you know this A or B, right? And that we can answer and then people are pretty consistent about it and you just come up with all possible permutations so that everything, every condition is side by side in one direction or another. You apply them more quickly because you have to cover more conditions. And then we can identify, say, the stiffness of the device that a person likes 
and it's consistent if we if we ask them to compare to a bunch of other stiffnesses. Um, does that speak to your question? Or yeah, it's encouraging me that definitely yeah. the residual limb could be experiencing pressures that during some of the um, control regimes are just beyond what's comfortable for the user, and if it hurts to move, then that's going to drive up. Absolutely. Uh, so, <clears throat> so rather than go with it. Absolutely, absolutely true, but that can't explain why the ankle exoskeleton on the un, on the unamputated limb doesn't give you more benefit. But so. I think it could to some extent. Okay. So if you're moving harder at that unamputated limb, yeah, yeah. then the next, then the full stride is landing on that limb that has had the amputation. So depending on... That's true. It's all dynamically coupled. It could, it could be, but the thing is that, uh, well, I mean, it's, it's possible, but um, <clears throat> the simulation work in this domain suggests that, first of all, you should be able to achieve big improvements in energy cost for people with amputation with different prosthesis control, and uh, that actually if you assist the unamputated limb, it should reduce loading that's associated with pain on the amputated limb. Like more, so, so actually what, what tends to happen if you have asymmetric assistance is that the person produces more work with the assisted leg overall than unassisted leg, and there are changes in temporal and spatial characters. It's, it goes, you, you become asymmetric in ways that you would expect. You would expect to make things easier on the amputated yeah. side. But it's, it's entirely possible, yeah. yeah. Purely as a qualitative yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, opinion based on, I've had a few knee surgeries. Used sure. to be an acrobat, not so much anymore. And I find that the more force I put out with the healthy leg when I'm recovering, the more I need to compensate with the cane on the leg that is injured because the more loading that next step puts on the leg that is injured. Now, some, something, something to just tease out here, um, and, I, I, and I, I, I don't know I, I, uh, your particular experience, but is it possible that what you're thinking about is increasing your speed, and that that is leading to increased loading on both limbs? Because these experiments are performed at constant speed, so which I think changes things a little bit. Uh, it de depends on how you constrain things. Right? If, you, if, you're, um, if you don't constrain speed and you start to push off a lot more, then people tend to increase speed. And then that would increase loading on the, potentially, on the prosthetic limb as well. I couldn't say how, I, how, how I'd respond to a prosthetic simply because I've never had the experience of one of the ones in your experience. I'd be curious after the next knee surgery to try it out, but it might not be mobile enough to actually get to the lab. I feel you. Yeah, but I, this is something you could try, like, just on a treadmill. If you consciously, people are pretty good at consciously modulating the, their, how much they push off with their, their leg. And there are a number of experiments showing just con conscious modulation using biofeedback. You could try. Let me know if you do. I, I mean, I, I, it's, so I'm, I'm saying I don't think it's what you're saying, but I actually don't know. It, very, it could be, right? There's something happening that, that we don't understand, and it could be that there's something about coupling between the sound and amputated limb that means that the person's mechanically unable to benefit from that assistance without uh, requiring motor control that's unavailable to them or without inducing pain or something. It's entirely possible. It's also I don't possible know. the fear itself is a factor in it. The fear of being hurt can be more powerful than the injury itself. It, it, it could be. That's true. It could be. Or training from the prosthetist about how you're supposed to walk. Um, it absolutely could be. I, I don't know. I, it's the truth. The, yes? Uh, so along those lines, it's very strange to me that the, uh, the exoskeleton, the unaffected, <clears throat> doesn't help with the prosthesis. Have you thought about asking the participants to mimic amputation with the one leg, like taping or something like that, and then with the other leg to see maybe we have not. The of this difference? We have not, um, but I would be really surprised if, say, wearing an air cast on one leg and then assisting the other leg, uh, if you didn't see benefits from assistance. Um, so when I was a PhD student, we did an experiment with air casts on both ankles. Mm -hmm. And 
surprisingly, uh, con in contradiction to our model predictions, uh, we did not see a increase in energy cost of walking. So we, that we had three conditions, just normal walking, walking with air cast boots, and then walking with an equivalent mass on the shoe. <clears throat> and the cost of equivalent mass and air cast boots were identical for metabolic rate. The center of mass work rate was dramatically different. So you know, if you've looked at center of mass work rate figures before, I'm not sure if you have done these analyses, but there's typically, um, so you have this characteristic pattern where if this is the 100% uh, stance during walking, and this is uh, the rate of work on the center mass of an individual leg. First, you have this collision phase. Then there's this rebound. And then there's this initial storage. And then this push off like this. So you do a lot of positive work with the trailing leg here. You do a lot of negative work with the leading leg here. And <clears throat> our simple dynamic walking models, like the past simplest walking model stuff, says this and this are really, they're coupled. And when you increase this, it'll decrease this and stuff like that. And that these things, the amount of work here, especially the amount of positive center mass work, should be correlated with metabolic rate. And when we put on the air cast boots, uh, let's see, I think it's something like this. So this went down, and this didn't get bigger. It got smaller. And uh, the energy cost was not changed. So you, there's, a, I, I think, uh, I'd have to, something like this. Anyways, there are big change in center mass work rate, and the energy cost didn't decrease. So I, my expectation would be you put an air cast on one foot, your energy cost doesn't change much. You assist the other leg, and you get a big benefit. But I don't know. It, it could be, yeah. Uh, that, that would be an interesting follow-on experiment. It's a lot easier than the uh, test with the amputees because college students. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, can you like put the tether on both the normal leg and the prosthetic leg? And then we sure could. And then see the, um, like the motion of the rope? from the normal leg without any like torque supplied and uh, I don't think I, I don't think I'm following um, like we can use the tether on both of them the prosthetic leg and the normal leg sorry I'm just writing down air cast to simulate prosthesis uh, mm -hmm. that's, worth, that's worth thinking about yeah so uh, sorry what 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 what's the so you're saying we put the exoskeleton on one leg and the prosthesis the powered prosthesis on the other we put the tether on both of you're saying, them. You're saying tether, but t uh, I don't understand what you mean by tether. Can you expand on that? Like Yeah, the uh, rope thing. Uh-huh. But, but you mean, but the tether is not doing anything unless it's connected to a device. So can you, what device are you talking about? Like the, so we've got the exoskeleton on one leg. Yeah. Then on the other, what do we have? Yeah, so I'm, I'm suggesting that uh, we, uh, we can use the exoskeleton on both of them. Well, so, so this side is, uh, has a prosthesis. So um, the way we would power this side would be to replace this conventional prosthesis with our powered prosthesis. Yeah, so like... Uh, Putting the exoskeleton on top of it wouldn't work very well because um, the joint here is really, it's like this stiff joint, and then our exoskeleton would have to be fighting the conventional prosthesis. Like, do, do you know what I mean? I was thinking something like uh, measure the parameters on the normal leg uh -huh. and then copy them to the... Yes, this has been tried. This is called echo control. It's one of the first powered prosthesis techniques from the 70s, uh, pioneered by this guy Woody Flowers at MIT. And we've tried stuff like that. It, it, it doesn't help. So, sorry. Now, it's, it's like, it's this kind of the same as, as you see in our... Um, in this experiment, just you, you, yeah. So like the uh, yeah. The parameters of the left leg don't apply to the right leg, something like that. 
Yeah, so, so there, there, are, uh, there are a couple of things to tease out here. So one is um, the idea that biomimicry is best. The other is the idea that symmetry is best. And I think both are probably reasonable guesses when you have a symmetric biological system. But when you change the body by amputating a portion of one limb, there are profound implications of that change. So the uh, control properties change and the cost structure changes. Right? So um, if the, the prosthesis side does more work, the person doesn't experience more effort, for example. Just as a simple change. The, the mass of this is a lot less than the mass of your deck limb as another simple uh, example of a change. So uh, doing exactly the same thing on the amputated side is very unlikely to be the optimal way of controlling the system, if you think about it. In general, you would expect an asymmetric system to have an asymmetric optimal control pattern. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I think it's a perfectly good idea about something to try. It turns out it doesn't work. I think that's part of why. I find it frustrating too. So like, uh, yeah. what if we copy the leg exactly the same? Uh, you can't. That's the thing. So, um, so if we grow a new leg and we surgically attach it so that it's exactly the same, then great. But any robot you stick on the person's body is not the same as this, right? This is really different. This is like. A bunch of uh, there's you know hundreds of motor units in here. There are uh, I don't know thousands, tens of thousands of sensors distributed through here that are all connected up to the spinal cord, the motor units as well, and that that part of it is really different when you replace it with a motor and and a aluminum joint and stuff like that that's not integrated with the nervous system at all. So that's really different, and and then. You know, this is a motor, and this is muscles, and those things have very different properties. For example, one of the things, one of our guesses as to why the exoskeletons optimize to the patterns that they do is that they sort of fill in a, a weakness of muscle. So muscle force tends to drop off with speed, which is a well-known relationship between the peak force muscle can produce and its contraction rate. And so at the end of this push-off phase, the, the, your calf muscles are contracting fast, so it's expensive to produce power with them. And the exoskeleton, though, doesn't have that. Electric motors don't have this issue. That you can produce, they can produce high torque at high speed. So um, anyways, does that kind of make sense? You can't, you can't really match it short of exactly matching it. OK. Oh, uh, but I'm seeing shifting and not many people here. And did you ask a question? You do have one. So I, has everybody, have you asked a question? Did you have any? OK. You, you didn't ask a question either. No, do you? I have a good answer to someone else. OK, great. Yeah, Last question. Congratulations. Make it good. No pressure. So uh, the question was, uh, now that we are using exoskeleton, we have an additional weight over the leg. So due to this weight, do we have a uh, change in the swing phase? Like, is it going to be shorter or? Again, will this shorter or longer swing phase have an effect on your gait cycle and then cause your speed to reduce or increase or anything? Uh, yes. V very likely. I, we haven't studied it carefully, but I would ex assume so. So here's the no exoskeleton. Here's zero torque. And look at the arm movements. They're bigger. So um, the arm movements counteract some of the angular momentum of the legs. So you add le mass to the legs. then. You get more angular momentum change as the leg swing, and you see this counter, counter movement of the arms. So we haven't looked carefully at, at, into this question, but I would expect you'd see slightly uh, lower step frequency mm -hmm. because it's more costly to swing the legs fast, and maybe more compensation with the uh, head trunk and arms. It's a, it's a good question. But still, the, the net effect is even though there is this compensation and it's harder to swing the leg in some ways, you still get this net benefit in terms of energy cost. And uh, so using it for chronic uh, stroke people. Yes. So uh, do we have back drivability in this? Back drivability? Yes. What we do is K 
get out of the way. You put some slack in. Yeah, so, uh, but then, then you said uh, the efficacy for using chronic stroke was only 5%. Yes. So, I mean, what was the reason for it to be low? I don't have, know. Uh, when you have back drivability, back drivability, I think it should have been even more than that. I, well, I don't think back drivability has much to do with it, right? I mean, it's the same exact hardware in the tests with uh, people that don't have stroke and the tests with people that do have stroke. So I, I don't think there are any sort of hardware characteristics that could explain the difference in response. The, di the difference in response has to be something about the person, like the population, right? Is that, does that make sense? Or yeah. I'm, I'm, maybe I'm missing it, yeah. Uh, then, uh, did the people with chronic stroke learn the proper walk using this prosthetic? I mean, using oh, uh, we think they did not learn how to take advantage of it very well, yes. Sorry, connect the dots for me. I, uh, I'm still missing it. Uh, so my question was like, was it low efficacy because they couldn't learn it? I think so. Walking because using the exoskeleton. And again, that was again due to not having back drivability, not as hard. Not having back drivability? Yeah, like, uh, so. Oh, uh, so maybe. Uh, are you giving you a chance to walk? But uh, you so you're thinking about, you're thinking about rehabilitation. Yeah, I you're think, thinking, yes. Class, so there you go. Okay, so you're thinking about the locomat. Yeah, yeah. Something and the like Hidler study, right. and showing that active engagement is needed to get ben the benefits of rehabilitation training. And I think you're 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 exactly right. I I, I went to the same school, and. I, you know, I'm a, I'm a fan of Hitler and Ferris and Rinkensmeyer and all those folks. And um, the, so uh, the, the uh, one fundamental difference between this system and the locomat is that this is torque control mm -hmm. and the locomat is position control. So this system is back drivable. So the, the resulting movement of the body uh, is a dynamic consequence of the contributions to torque both from the exoskeleton and from the person. Right? We're not constraining the person's movement. They can't go to sleep and walk in the device. Um, importantly, though, we are not attempting rehabilitation. We are attempting assistance only. And rehabilitation is a harder problem. And uh, there, if you think about trying to close the loop, the time to get one objective function evaluation is 10 weeks instead of two minutes. Because the, the, your outcome that you're trying to optimize is the change in the person's ability to move without the device after weeks of training. So it's daunting for trying to close that loop. I think it's still possible, but you need a lot of money and a, like a many year study and you'd have to make some little tweaks. Anyways, uh, but I, I, yeah, I think that this system has the kind of characteristics that Hitler or Rankinsmeyer or whomever would, would hypothesize, yes, these are desirable for rehabilitation. The person needs to be actively involved to generate the desired movement. But, but I do not claim that this device is good for rehabilitation. Thank you very much. <clears throat> All right. Good questions, guys. Good crew here. I really enjoyed things. Seeing the live processing. Yeah, right on.